Young is not like you, like you would want to shoot it at the moon, you know. <laughs> he was so professional. So he would actually yeah, shoot yeah, it. No, no, I, I, I just immediately get the last picture I see. They had the, the scene of hey, the teams, people. And in the background, yeah. the moon. Sorry, my computer was <laughs> taking a long time. Can you hear me? Hey. So what we saw last time, last thing was uh, this uh, gamma factor. It's just uh, an exponential to the negative. Professor, you're muted. How's that? <laughs> Better? Yeah. Okay. So EG is the gamma energy. Professor, can you open the door? Open the door? Oh. <laughs> oh I was like, one more thing. Okay, so the gamma energy depends on the charge in the, in the two nuclei, the nuclear charge. Also on the point structure parameter, the reduced mass, um, speed of light, pi. So mostly um, constants. So this gamma factor, what is it? What does it tell us? So it's the uh, probability as a function of the energy that you're going to have uh, quantum tunneling that is strong enough or like it's likely enough to, to create, um, uh, to have a nuclear fusion. Okay, so now let's look at some of the details, and we're going to combine this function with another one at the end of the lecture. So this is the proton proton chain. So known as PPJ. It has three parts, I guess. Three reactions. So the first one is this one.
second one is this one. There's going to be some energy release also, so, so some kinetic energy. Okay, so what did I write over here? What, what does it all mean? What is this guy over here? Photon? The notation that we use, there's a one over here. Uh, for this one, there's a two. So what does it mean, the one or the two? Hmm? The mass is related to the mass. The number of nucleons, yeah. So this one will have two nucleons. Um, there is another notation that you might find more complete. Um, it's superfluous, but you can put the one over here. So in this case, you will have Z, the number of protons, and this is A, the number of nucleons. So what is a nucleon? What is the definition of a nucleon? Mm -hmm. So typically proton or neutron. Um, so if this is the number of nucleons, this is the number of protons then you can also get the number of neutrons. In this case, it will be what? One, so it's just this one minus this one. And they mentioned that it's superfluous to write this one. Why? Because the symbol of the element tells you the, the number of protons. So hydrogen is one proton. What about helium? Two protons. Um, so I guess a nicer way, but more difficult to read, you can just write two on one. But it essentially tells you almost everything that you need to know. So um, this is helium-4, this is helium-3. So they have the same number of protons in the nucleus, two. But they have a different number of neutrons. So this one will have, this will have only one neutron. This one has two neutrons. So This is the reaction that powers the sun, or the set of reactions. So the first two happen twice. Uh, and each one will create one of these helium-3. And then the helium-3s can combine and form, or they will combine and form a helium-4. Form. Helium form. This one, this reaction happens once each time, um, each two times this happens. 
So what is this one over here? The E plus, which is what? It's the anti-electron, right? So it has the mass of the electron. Uh, it behaves as an electron, but the charge is positive instead of negative. And what is this one? The new neutrino. So whenever you have um, whenever you have a neutrino, this is an E. This is an electron neutrino. Whenever a neutrino is uh, produced in the reaction, that means that it's the result of the, the weak force as opposed to the to the strong force. So once the the positron is created, what do you think is going to happen to it? If this is in the sun. Yeah, it will annihilate right away, right? So we are never going to observe positrons coming out of the sun. They just uh, annihilate with, a, with an electron and um, radiation is produced, so gamma rays. What is this one, the gamma ray? Light, so it's, this one is producing photons. So this one will produce photons right after, right? Because the electron will uh, annihilate. What will happen to this neutrino? Hmm? That makes what? Yeah, it's, uh, it interacts very weakly with everything. So it essentially just leaves the sun undisturbed. They can be, you know, they, they do interact sometimes. And remember where I saw uh, this this problem, what group it was. It was kind of cool. So it had the number of neutrinos that were produced in the 1987 uh, supernova explosion. And so they were, I think they detected something like eight neutrinos total coming from that supernova explosion. Um, and in a, in a water uh, instrument, it uses um, water. And so the problem was like, okay, there's this much water in uh, the mass of a human. How many humans saw a flash that was the result of uh, an interaction of a neutrino from that from the supernova? And I didn't solve it, but I want to. <laughs> Wait, they solved it by science? Well, there's a probability, right? So there's like a ridiculously large number of neutrinos passing through the body over time to just interact. But there's always a chance that they're going to interact. And so with this... It will be a photon. No. <laughs> yeah, it will probably not cause, cause a uh, strong enough electric signal, but uh, maybe. Yeah, but, you know, so it's, you know, probable that a photon that was detected by, you know, by someone was actually an interaction with the neutrino. So, anyways. Um, So, yes. It depends. Yes. Today, you know, the I think the very first neutrino detector. Um, they had a thing like. 
from detergents, you know, with some chemical, with chlorine, and the chlorine interacts with, uh, with the neutrinos. And so the chlorine will become like argon or something like that. So they will, um, I, don't, I remember the element, I think it was argon. It was radioactive argon. So they can detect like, they can, they could count how many atoms were there. And so each atom was uh, uh, a detection. But they put them in different places. Like there's neutrino detectors that are like very close to nuclear reactors. And so I think they can change like the, the material and then they could check the different neutrinos. Um, so one of the issues we, I guess not an issue, something interesting about the neutrinos, there's three of them. There's the electron, uh, tau, and uh, muon, the three different varieties of, uh, of electrons, I guess. You shouldn't call them varieties. The cousins of the electron. And what's that? The, what? Yeah, these ones, so the electron neutrinos, uh, they were detecting less than they were expecting from the sun uh, with all the solar models. So it was like in the year 2000 or something that they realized that they, they change. So they are electron neutrinos for a little bit and then they switch into something else like tau neutrinos and then like uh, muon neutrinos and they're always changing. So it's kind of weird because um, it's one of the quantum numbers, right? It's like if the mass were continuously changing. So it's kind of a weird thing. So even though you don't have too many counts, you know, detections of neutrinos, it's one of the, I think it's one of the most active fields right now, of neutrino physics. Um, then they detected that they had mass, you know, present or something. Okay, so sometimes this hydrogen is just called P or proton. So you might see it this way too. And this one sometimes is just called D for uh, deuterium. Um, but you know, but this is what they, they are. Um, so you guys know what an isotope is, right? What is it? So we had hydrogen one and hydrogen two. Are they isotopes? So they have the same Z. They have a different number of neutrons, right? Or nucleons, depending on um, the terminology that you're using. So what about this one? Is it also an isotope? So what is uh, an isotope? This should give you a clue, the P or the N. Right. So if you look at the, I don't remember how this uh, curve is called, but essentially you can put the number of protons over here the number uh, of neutrons over here. And so this will be just a chemical element. And initially, um, you have like one proton for each neutron. But then you need like heavier and heavier, um, I guess more and more neutrons to keep 
the nucleus stable in a given number of protons. So if you look along this line over here, the vertical, then uh, all of these elements will be um, isotopes. So they have the same number of uh, protons. Um, then if you look at the line like this, and all of these are different elements, but they have the same number of neutrons, so they are isotopes. And the other one that is related is called the isobar. So they have the same number uh, of nucleons, so their, their mass is the same. So for an example of uh, Isotope. We're going to see more of this reaction. Just a little bit of terminology. So the twelve and seven. Born is an isotope of. Thirteen six carbon. So this is the charge or the number of protons. And so there's seven neutrons over here and also here. So these are isotones. And for isobars will be, for example, 40, 18 argon, or 40, 19 um, potassium, or 40, 20 calcium. And they have the same number of nucleons, even if the number of protons is changing. This would be 22 neutrons, 21 neutrons, and 20 neutrons. Okay, so we're going to look at the, the weak nuclear force. So This is a proton, this is another proton. How common is this reaction? Because um, what I'm trying to ask, where I'm going with this. Um, have you seen a system with just two protons and no neutrons. So how is this formed? Helium always has um, neutrons, either one or two. But you need you need a neutron in there to make it stable. So just the two protons is not stable. So you know, this gives you a hint. There's something else at, at play, which is the it's going to be the weak interaction. So in that uh, gamma factor that we derived, that only tells you what is the probability that, that these two protons 
can tunnel through their Coulomb potentials. And that's going to happen you know, with some probability. Most of the time, nothing happens. So we would just overlap the work functions and then they, they in a very small, um, with a very small frequency, uh, the, the weak interaction is going to make this, let's call it like a, a virtual, I want to call it virtual. So let's, let's say that this atom can uh, exist for a very small fraction of time uh, with, the, with the quantum tunneling. There's a probability that it can decay into a deuterium. So what is necessary for these two protons to decay into a proton and a neutron? So a proton is three parts, up, up, and down. And the neutron is up, down, and down. What do you require? for this system to become a um, computerium. One of these parts is going to flip. So this up is going to become a down. Um, this reaction from up to down is going to release the positron and the neutrino. So what is the charge of the up and down parts? Mm -hmm. So two thirds for up and down is negative one third. So the charge of the proton is one. The neutron, sorry, it's two thirds. Minus one third, minus one third, zero. So if you change these um, up into a down, you change in charge is minus one third minus two thirds. Oops. So in order to conserve charge, a positive one has to be produced. So this one you know, cannot be held by the pull of interaction, so it just leaves the system. Uh, this one, the neutrino, you need it to conserve uh, mass and energy, as we'll see in a little bit. So what's happening is that and there's a tiny chance that the wave functions of the protons are going to tunnel through their Coulomb potential. And there's an even smaller change, chance that while that is happening, or while that is true, the weak force, or the weak interaction, is going to flip uh, one of these up 
into a down quark. So then the deuterium is actually stable. Pretty, it has a very long uh, lifetime. So once that happens, it gets trapped. And then the next reaction is one hydrogen plus becomes so that uh, deuterium is going to or deuteron if it's the nucleus is going to interact with another hydrogen to create helium. So this reaction happens on average, you know, with the density of the sun and everything, the temperature of the sun. It happens on average once every 10 billion years. So it's extremely rare. There are so many atoms, but it's actually happening all the time. This reaction over here takes one second on average to find another hydrogen and become helium. So one of the consequences of these two ratios, so this is the, this is the, uh, the bottom. Is there deuterium in, uh, in our environment or in the universe? Pretty much every kind of water or there that we drink. Um, where did it come from? Deuterium cannot exist in stars. It gets fused into a helium right away. All the deuterium that we see here in the universe had to be created at the Big Bang, or I guess shortly after the Big Bang. So that's kind of cool. I think one out of probably 6,000 um, water molecules contains uh, uh, deuterium. Okay, so we have that combination of forces. So I'm just going to look a little bit more at that um, flip of the, of the part. How can it flip? What does it need and why will it flip? I mean, it, it releases the charge. Right. Well, you cannot separate quarks. Like, I was thinking that since the positive charge is like, the fact that it doesn't, yeah, it has, definitely matters because the, the weak force and the electromagnetic force um, interact pretty, pretty strongly. But, 
I guess one way to think about it, um, say that you have your, your, your say that you have a hydrogen atom. You have your proton over here and you have your electron over here. This electron can absorb a photon, move to a more energetic orbit, right? And then at some point, to later point, it can go back and release um, the, the photon that it had absorbed. Well, it turns out that quarks can do the same. So they have the weight function, and if they absorb some energy, we can accommodate it. It will just be, you know, a shorter wavelength. So, hmm? um, they can absorb. They can absorb neutrinos. They can absorb. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think they can absorb radiation, like just photons. They're not completely sure. Um, but they, you know, they, they can absorb certain shapes, certain forms of energy. So, you know, when the electron absorbs the photon, it is in an excited state and can go back to its ground state. Is the neutron in an excited state? So, I guess I'm asking if there's a ground state. So, neutron. Yes, lowest energy. So neutron is an excited state of a proton. Okay, so if you have them together in a nucleus, then you know, they they become stable. They can last in that uh, arrangement for a very long time. But a neutron, if you just leave it in the environment, it decays. Its lifetime, I think, is like 880 seconds or something like that. So you know, relative to other particles, it lasts for a long time, but it will decay into a proton and um, an electron and some electron neutrino. So you know, this, uh, this is a very, it's a very interesting interaction of all the forces. Right, so the fact what what you learn in mechanics, right, that um, all the systems will try to minimize their energy, it's still true. But there are energy landscapes. So Um, depending on you know how tall this energy barrier is, we will, we will something like that. So maybe this is a proton by itself, and in combination with another proton, it will find uh, it will be at a lower energy state. But it requires something to happen for it to be able to move past this barrier into this lower energy state. So I guess what needs to happen in this case, I guess is um, while they're very close together, one of the quarks flips and they suddenly, they, found, they find themselves in a lower energy state. But then with another hydrogen, very quickly, maybe it looks a little bit like this. 
very quickly they move to the helium state. So you know, all the interesting physics happens in here, but it tells you, this tells you, uh, you know, what is the kind of the ultimate state of things. So we see not just helium, you know, we see lithium, beryllium, everything, carbon, everything that forms us. Does this mean that we can continue building heavier and heavier elements? Which, which, what is that point? Iron? Why? Mm -hmm. So, if you look at the energy, the binding energy, let's say, as a function of the number of protons. Then it looks um, let's say that this is the more stable direction. like that. This is iron. So initially, you know, with, uh, with lithium, with um, uh, helium, uh, with boron, with carbon, you gain a lot of energy per nucleon by fusing them. But as you start to fuse bigger and bigger atoms, the energy gain is um, smaller, and iron is the last element that uh, that you can get energy out of uh, out of uh, out of its formation. For everything after, you have to put energy in, and this is why you know, iron is the last thing that can be fused in a stock. Everything heavier than than iron has to be created in supernova explosions or other um, very energetic events. So, so hydrogen is extremely common in the universe. Helium is also pretty common. What are the other elements that are common? Like if you just rank them by number of atoms that you find. Carbon is pretty, um, it's pretty, it's pretty common. Oxygen. Boron is probably popular just because, yeah. Nitrogen is, is pretty, pretty, pretty popular. So the most popular, the most common uh, elements um, are the ones that feel the energy levels uh, of the nucleus. So it's gonna have energy levels kind of like the, um, the electrons, you know, with the S, P, D, and F uh, orbitals. So the structure is more complicated because you have uh, two kinds. You have up and down as opposed to just electrons. And so perhaps it's not that surprising that, that they orbit. So 
the you know let's let's think about the SMP electrons. So the S electrons are just a sphere, right? And the P electrons uh, look like that. So they are centered about the nucleus. But there's, you know, apart from that, there's nothing special about these shapes. So these are just the solutions to the, uh, these are spherical harmonics. So it's a solution to the Schrodinger equation. So the, you know, the, the nucleus is going to look like this too. They're just around their center of mass. But you know, it, this is much tinier, much, much tinier. And you have other effects. Like this is just you know, for one kind, it will be the electrons. You have two kinds over here. Um, but they just, you know, they follow the same uh, shorting equation. So some of them, just like, you know, helium, uh, neon, um, even the some of the noble metals, gold, silver, copper, they're more stable than the elements around them. Um, then at the nuclear level, you have the same effect. So oxygen is extremely stable, carbon is extremely stable, helium is extremely stable. So I guess we don't use helium very much, but all the other elements that make humans, they are, uh, you know, in the, in the nuclear point of view, stable. Okay, so I want to ask you. You can you can what? Your life? You know, it's it's a combination of things, right? Like helium is not chemically reactive, so we might have some some trouble there. <laughs> Okay, so what is mass? So the mass of the proton is one point sixty seven to and since the negative 27 kilograms. So if you want to put that in MEV per T squared, 938. 0.27. The mass of the neutron, you think it's going to be more or less Why is it a little more? Hmm? Mm -hmm. This is 939.56. So it has a little bit more energy um, that it trapped, and so that's why its mass is a little higher. So the mass of a quark the up quark is 2.2. mv per c squared, and the mass of the down part is 4.7. 
where is the rest of the mass coming from? If you just, you know, add these in the right way, you get that the proton to be 9.1 and the neutron should be 11.6. It's a pretty big problem. So where is that extra mass, like 99% of the mass coming from? So what we perceive to be mass is um, the energy. And the binding energy, the nuclear binding energy of the quarks, that's what really gives the proton and the neutron their mass qualities. Um, and this is true for uh, most particles. So there's also the Higgs boson that I'm not gonna go into again, but <laughs> they haven't read about it. But most of the mass of all the particles, they're going to come from um, from, their, from their binding energy. In this case, nuclear will also be uh, Okay, so... Yeah. Nah, more, that was 99. <laughs> Yeah, so they're, they want to be together, so it's somehow, you know, that makes them more difficult to move. They interact gravitationally with this mass. Oh, ourselves, our true mass. Well, what do you mean by true mass? Yeah, so there seems to be like the inherent mass that is created by the heat boson but most of the mass, and the mass of the particles that you see around, it, there's a very small contribution of the Higgs boson, so for protons and neutrons, you know, it's like 1%. And 99% is the, um, the nuclear force, the strong force. So, you know, that inherent mass is the energy produced by things trying to move from the heat steel. But you know, really you can you can separate the contributions to the mass, but I don't think you can say that only one of them is a true mass. You know, like it's it's the it's putting everything together to the, the mass. Okay, so you know think about that. It's um I think it's a lot to think about. <laughs> you know, how, how the universe seems to be predictable, um, but the interactions are not necessarily the same. Okay, so let's look at the that last part, last reaction. <laughs>
So this one happens once every 300,000 years. So you know, the first one, uh, once every 10 to the 10 years. The second one, uh, once per one second, I guess something times 10 to the negative seven years. And this one, um, once every three times 10 to the five years. So we're not going to see the deuterium in the sun. We see a lot of hydrogen, it's mostly hydrogen still. And we should see, because you know, this, this happens it's a relatively long time, not long compared to this one. Um, it's instantaneous compared to the first reaction. But we should see some helium tree in the sun, you know, at any given point. So this is actually only one option. Once you have once you have the the three heliums or helium trees, then you have other options. So we can call this tree prime. can trap or can uh, fuse with, uh, with uh, helium-4. This will give you beryllium and the gamma ray. And then from here, you can do either combine with an electron this will give you lithium uh, plus an electron neutrino. And then that lithium seven can fuse with a hydrogen to create helium four. So it gets to the helium four as well. Then this one over here can also go to this one is more complicated. Seven beryllium plus hydrogen. Eight boron plus gamma. And then the eight boron decays into eight beryllium plus the positron plus the electron neutrino. So this is through the weak interaction also. And then the eight beryllium decays into two or helium or helium four. So all of these reactions happen or occur in the sun. Uh, this one happens about 70% of the time. And this other route happens about 30% of the time. So you, know, you can see that by analyzing the, uh, the traces of materials in, of elements in stars, you can figure out, you know, what is their relative um, occurrence of these two reactions. And there's another one, which I don't think we will have time to go into, but it's called CNO. So 
CNO uses carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as like when you want to speed up a chemical reaction. Yes, so they're catal catalyzers. Catalysts. Yeah, so they're um, they're catalyst of of a reaction that is you know ends up producing the helium four. So carbon, neutron, uh, nitrogen, and oxygen uh, were formed in previous generations of stars, and they are catalysts. So the number of atoms that you have of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen they don't change, but they facilitate these chemical re these uh, nuclear reactions. And so CNO is the dominant way of producing helium for in stars that are uh, 1.2 times as massive as the sun. So the sun doesn't do this. It's just a proton-proton chain. And in stars that are a little bit more massive, they do PP chain, but they do more. They produce more helium through uh, CNO. And you know, this is not more complicated in terms of just looking at the conservation of nucleons. Uh, it's, it's not more complicated than uh, like chemistry. What are these chemicals like? Carbon, neutron, and oxygen? So, mm. oh, I see the actual reactions. Uh, they become like, you know, beryllium's and borons and other things. Um, but then at the end of the reaction, you, know, they, you end up with the same carbon that you started with. But they do become like other elements in the, uh, during different reactions. And so the 15 nitrogen uh, combines with the hydrogen to form 16 oxygen and a gamma, and then the oxygen becomes a piece of greater hydrogen, it creates fluorine and a gamma. Fluorine decays into oxygen and a positron. So there's like a different chains. Um, so they do become other things in them along the way to go back to uh, creating. Not the energy, no. So just the number of carbon, neutron, and oxygen. So they are still fusing, you know, through these elements, still fusing hydrogen into helium-4. And so from the helium-4, you get the energy. Yeah, it is, this is good. Okay, so. I'm going to move quickly to this one. Hopefully, you can give me 10 minutes. So consider this guy, this uh, cross section. This is uh, gonna be the, the cross section of a nuclear reaction.
So remember, I told you how I see these cross sections, just like these atoms with like shields. So the higher, larger the cross section, the larger the probability that you're going to have a particular reaction. So just like you had a scattering cross section or an absorption cross section, uh, you also have a nuclear cross section. So these ones are much smaller than the ones that we saw before, but mathematically they are the same thing. So this S can be measured um, experimentally. Uh, it can also be derived from, uh, from, from theories. But for the most part, it's going to be, it's, it's a constant. So most of the energy dependence of the cross section comes from this E over E. On this. this one is not dependent on the energy. So imagine that you have, you know, one atom of kind A and it's moving into a region where there's atoms of, of uh, type B. So then the number of reactions that you might expect to have is NB, or NB is the density, just the, the number density of the atoms, in the scattering cross section of the AB reaction, the, uh, the distance. So this is going to be one dimensional traveling in a really. Mm. Yeah. So if you divide by the time, then you get um, NB sigma AB, and then this is just the velocity. So it's the velocity of the AB the relative velocity between A and B, the A and B atom. So the reaction rate is Na to multiply by the number, and now we have several over here that are traveling and finding these Bs. So it's the density of A's uh, density of these sigma, so the probability of the reaction occurring essentially, and then the velocity. Okay, so this one over here, it's a number per, uh, per unit time. This one too, it's just a... This one? Yeah. This is the reaction rate. So, yeah, it's like a constant, right? it tells you um, how often this happens for unit time. So if we multiply this times Q, where Q is the energy produced by the nuclear reaction, this, this particular AD nuclear reaction. Then this is an energy per unit time. So this is a power. And as you might expect, you know, through, there's gonna be other physics that is going to modify it a little bit, but this is gonna be very close to your luminosity. Okay, so, If we divide these by rho, which is uh, the density, mass density, 
then you get power per unit on this. Oh, it's already, it already has a time, so it's just power per unit mass. Okay, so it's okay. I'm gonna stop over here. So, what I wanted to show you, I'll show you next time. So the gamma factor, you know, it's proportional to so E G is a constant that depends on the charge. So this one, how does, how does it look like? When increasing energy, it increases, right? If you use this reaction so the next step is to get this velocity the velocity between a and b and it is going to be a distribution and it's going to be given by uh, maxwell boltzmann and so you can express the reaction rate or the hoping power per unit mass as a function of the energy and the reduced mass and and that's it oh and the temperature this one has a it's going to have a temperature in the maxwell boltzmann so it's going to be proportional to e to the minus d so it's going to look kind of like this so the number, you know, the, the, if you multiply the two probabilities, this so is going to, yes, it comes from the velocity distribution. It's going to be the, it's going to be bottom. So if you multiply them, it's going to look like that. I'm going to derive this next time. So, Gonna look a little bit like a Gaussian. So you're gonna have a width over here. It's not exactly a Gaussian, you know, this, this is gonna be a long tail. But it can be approximated pretty well by a Gaussian. You're gonna have a an energy unit over here where the, the the probability is maximum. So if you take uh, the integral of this, you get the total power. But it, this is a function. This one depends on the charge. This one depends on the um, reduced mass, so the mass of the A and B, and the temperature. So, where you have the maximum for a particular reaction depends, you know, you can describe it with these two. So if it's gonna be hydrogen, hydrogen, you can put it over here. If it's helium, helium to become, you know, helium three, helium three to become helium four, it goes here. And then this temperature is gonna be given by temperature of the star. And so we will see that there's a pretty interesting interaction between these two that kind of keeps you at a certain temperature for uh, for the reaction being done in the star. 
So most stars that are just fusing, I guess all stars that are fusing hydrogen into helium are going to have a very similar temperature at the core, even if the mass is very different. But you know, once they move to something else, CNO will be a little different. Um, you know, fusing helium into carbon, you require a much higher uh, temperature. We will we'll see that. Um, all right, so any questions about the homework? Or about the mini research project? Or about collaboration? Yeah. It, it is a phase space. Mm -hmm. Three R. What do you mean? You can. So I haven't haven't done that problem. The one that I have to tonight. But each direction is the same as any other direction. So you can just. Uh, reduce it to a one-dimensional problem. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, and then, you know, it's, it's kind of like we have the three halves of kt squared, right? So it's one half in each degree of, uh, of freedom. So, yeah, don't worry. Okay. Yeah, I think it was one too much about I was the, just more curious, I guess. Yes. Um, I guess, I don't know if the, I was just wanted to ask since you have not, probably it's due on Thursday, so it's kind of fun. It's due on Sunday. Oh, it's due on Sunday, never mind. I'm going to ask you to I'm going to ask you to So there's three projects, right? Well, potential projects. There's two manuscripts. One is about like the thermal, uh, gravel thermal effect. And the other one is about, uh, I guess, no, for this one. You should check again. So the other one is about, they call them dark stars. It's like um, stars that are using dark matter as their materials that could have existed at the beginning of the universe. Um, so you can explain uh, either of those two papers, and you know the equations in both of them. You, they should be familiar, like from what we have seen in class. Like in, I, I thought that the dark star was pretty cool because you know, they have like a the PDT. Yeah. Was that? I wish you had done that one first. I would take that one. Oh, so you already started? Yeah, I read the other one. We talked about it on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, and so the, the, the third option is um, to work with the code, right, in, in that book. So if you go to the companion website, you can download the C++ code. And uh, I think it runs on Windows without any issues. Hmm? You have a you have a Windows? Okay. Yeah. Someone told me that it didn't work on Mac, so I'm gonna check that one. So, are you having any? So it works just fine. <laughs> well, it's nice, right? Mm hmm. So it's supposed to be, you know, not difficult to read. Like they say that it's not, if, if you read the appendix, they describe the code. And it says that it's like not re research level. Uh, it's supposed to be more 
pedagogical, but you can see like different components of the stuff. And I don't think you have to, I don't think you have to modify the code in any way. You just have to change the, like the mass and the percentage of helium and hydrogen and things like that. And I think the constants from one of the other folders. I think the constants was in like Appendix A. So there is there is a discussion forum if you go to a mini research project or research mini project. Uh, I put it in there for people to just ask technical questions. Um, and that way, you know, instead of getting a lot of emails and maybe people having the same question, um, just put your question over there um, or your comments, and uh, I will try to answer them. So for, you know, for no, no matter what project you pick, uh, you have to uh, you have to record a video and just upload it. Yeah, just, just describing what you did. And you should not take long. You, know, you don't have to make slides or anything, just describe it. Okay. Uh, anything else? Okay. Collaboration, you can ask people for help and then you can give points to each person. Uh, doesn't mean that you can write only one report you know, or, or turn in only one thing. You have, each person has to turn in something. Okay, awesome. Oops. I hope you don't have a class after this. No. Do we have I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs>